Okay, well, let's just see. Um, I do. Um, I do want to start with the wildfire, but maybe not aspects of it that you might have thought. Here's just as background. This is um, Kauai visitor arrivals, and uh, they've obviously had a bit more of a roller coaster because of Iniki thirty years ago. But just to test your knowledge, every vertical line is a specific exogenous shock. Uh, to the economy or to the quiet economy, and so I'll let it sit there for a moment so you can you can uh, uh, test your knowledge. And you'll see I wrote in a few just hints. You can see the Omicron, the Delta variant, and the Alpha variant of the COVID event a, a couple of years ago showing up there. Okay, so here are the here are the actual things that have happened, and so. Kamani's not old enough to remember, but you, some of you will remember Roseanne Rosanna Dana on Saturday Night Live, where she would always say, it's always something. If it's not one thing, it's another, right? And um, that's, I mean, this is reality. In fact, if you look at the 20 teens, you see that really steady growth of tourism volume coming out of the, a deep recession, to be sure. Um, but you see that steady growth we actually went through a period of tranquility in the 2018s that I think was a little bit um, distracting. And um, Mount, uh, Kauai didn't because they had those floods in, uh, people forget about the floods because they remember the East Rift eruption. But in April, uh, I think it is uh, 2018, Kauai had these this, the, the, the highest 24 uh, hour total rainfall ever in America and um, wash out the roads and whatnot to the North Shore. But, okay, so this is life as we know it. Um, the schadenfreude here is that Kauai is benefiting from the Maui wildfires, which is awful to say, but that's right, the spillover. And, uh, but notably, even Kauai post-pandemic really hasn't gotten back to where it was, uh, you know, really hasn't materially punched out to, its, to where it stalled out pre-pandemic after the after the flooding there and uh, that's kind of a metaphor for what's going on in the local economy um in general um just just to give another sharp contrast we're at the four-month anniversary of the wildfires four months after aniki home building on Kauai was peaking the rebuild the uh Joanne Yukimura, the mayor, set up an office of emergency permitting within weeks of the of the hurricane. And even though they only had like a lot, a lot of people didn't have power, <clears throat> and the situation was different. The hurricane, you know, scraped everybody's foundation so they could just rebuild on the existing foundation. Uh, Lahaina is different because you can't go back there, and people are just. I mean, I don't know why. The mayor just hasn't said, okay, we'll get around to Lahaina in a few years. But right now, we have to build somewhere else. But I don't hear that conversation. So, you know, I mean, as far as I can tell, there's no additional home building going on on Maui right now. And as I say, on the four-month anniversary, this, the contrast between how it was possible to do this, and it's, it's impossible to do this today. People don't know how. I, my brother um, was a or is, I don't know, an aerospace engineer. And for years and years, he worked on satellites, Lockheed and this and that. And then about 20 years ago, he go joins this little company called SpaceX, Elon Musk's new company. And he's about 50 at that time. And he's the oldest guy in the company. Actually, his boss is the oldest guy in the company. He's the second oldest guy in the company. But his boss leaves very quickly after, uh, you know, starting up their area. And he and I, I would ask him, so what do you guys do? And well, we're going to build rockets. And and how's that going? He said, well, nobody's built rockets for 30 years in America. So they like nobody knew how. And my brother didn't know how. And he's the oldest guy in the company. So nobody had ever been around at a time when people build rockets. And that's we're 30 years from a Nike. And nobody knows how to say, OK, we're going to build 2000 homes boom, and have it happen. And that's a weird, I mean, you listen to these guys now, and it's kind of bizarre what they're talking about on Maui. And I tell you what, I'm working for the carpetbaggers, like I'm a subcontractor to a 
you know, these people that follow FEMA around the country and, and we're working for a federal government agency and it's, it's it's the most bizarre experience I've ever had. I'm like the Hawaii guy on this team. Anyway, the problem I want to focus on that I think is ubiquitous and something we need to think about is asymmetric information and now disinformation. So this is a meme from the volcano from the East Rift eruption a few years ago. And this idea that, you know, Maui, the entire island of Maui had a wildfire is kind of the thing we're still having to overcome. Mufi Hanneman, who now is going to run the HTA board, that, you know, the two weeks after the meeting, after the wildfire at the HTA board meeting was like, you guys, we got to get the messaging. <laughs> you, know, you, can, you can you can still go to Wailea. You know what I mean? A wildfire in Nanakuli does not mean you have to shut down Waikiki. But the problem is the messaging went out right away. Aquaman said, do not go to Maui on TikTok or something. And there you go. And so, uh, but worse than that, worse than that, you have the professional disinformation a, uh, a, um, agents, like Chinese <laughs> agents and Russian um, trolls uh, publishing disinformation about um, the Lahaina wildfire. And the Lahaina wildfire has the distinction of being the first wildfire or the first catastrophic event after which Chinese trolls use generative AI to create false a false narrative about the origins of the wildfire. So uh, I'll send you these slides. You can check out these articles in the New York Times. It's just fascinating. Um, and they're and in, working independently, Russia and China. So Maui's still struggling to get back. These are passenger arrivals relative to a year earlier. And to put that in context, Here's 9-11. So, Maui, you know, this is like a 9-11 event for Maui. Now, the spillover, for sure, right? People can go to Big Island or, you know, Kona, and people can go to uh, Kauai for some of that sort of Maui-type destination experience. So, for the state as a whole, it's not all that bad. For Maui, it's huge. These are Maui passenger counts. And for the state as a whole, because these are high-frequency data, daily data, so this is through um, December 7th weekly. I, I aggregate up to weeks because I can seasonally adjust weekly data. And so in terms of the state as a whole, the context statewide, where we're at, this theme I suggested a second ago is relevant that we're, we're still kind of stuck in this post-pandemic. We can't quite get back to this to the tranquil path I alluded to earlier, you know, the smooth path of, of, of gradual growth of passenger counts in the 20 teens. And obviously, and at least for those paying attention, concerns about over tourism and destination management and so on, those, those are still, you know, appropriate uh, things to be concerned about. How, not we, notwithstanding the fact I don't see any response to the concern, but um, there we are. So we're, you know, we're, Far from our potential. Question, somebody. Um, so that's sort of a, a specific case of a broader theme of um, where we're at, and Hawaii kind of um, just failing to keep up, so to speak. Now, one one place where we're not keeping up is in the uh, in the inflation arena, and you know, inflation as Milton Friedman famously said, inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon, and we're in a monetary union, so we wouldn't expect, and I have 80 years of data to show, that Hawaii inflation doesn't deviate much from the national average over time, not at all, on average over 80 years, never more than two percentage points for very long, and here hardly at all, although the fact that for much of this year, inflation in Hawaii was not just below the U.S. average, was was below the Fed's implied target, right? The Fed has a 2% inflation target for the personal consumption expenditure deflator measure of inflation, excluding uh, uh, excluding food and energy. Um, this is the consumer price index. It's, it's got a different structure. It tends to run about a half percentage point higher than the PCE deflator. And this is the all items 
CPI, so it includes food and energy. Nonetheless, a 2% inflation goal, uh, usually the Fed's 2% inflation goal, our inflation rate, and the CPI inflation rate generally would tend to run about 2.5%, and that's that horizontal pink band you see, pink band you see there. So we've We've actually been below U.S. inflation all through the one-year run-up in inflation, the one-year decline in inflation, and that's definitely a transitory inflation. And even in this now disinflationary period at the tail end where the U.S. has been stuck around 3% or more, and we briefly were down at 2%. Um, Hawaii inflation in November <clears throat> jumped, but it's pretty much over, and the Fed largely confirmed that yesterday. And I'm going to cough. Can you still hear me? Yes. Um, the composition of that November inflation showed that the recent mortgage rate increases are finally pushing into the housing costs. You have to remember, everybody refied pre-pandemic or, or in the early part of the pandemic. And so the higher interest rates that the Fed engineered in 2022 and 2023 didn't show up right away in the housing phone. I have no idea what's happening in apparel, which has had almost no inflation for 30 years, as anybody knows who's been to Ross Dress for Less in the last 20 years. But um, that's, you know, so there's a little bit of a, an inflation bounce back uh, in the numbers. And importantly, it's not in the food and energy component. The, you can see the Hawaii core rate is higher than the Hawaii all items rate. The energy components are negative and, and food has largely settled down. Um, but much of that had to do with the supply chain disruptions in 2021 and then subsequently the impact of Russia's invasion of Ukraine on grains, for example, and on energy commodities. So I think we're good. The supply part of the inflation, the Fed has a, an index, the San Francisco Fed has an index of breaks down the composition of inflation. The supply part of uh, that composition cannot be controlled by the by monetary policy, right? The Federal Reserve doesn't have an influence over how many five to seven nanosecond, you know, semiconductors are coming off the fab, uh, coming out of the fabs in Taiwan, which right after Sometime during the pandemic, a new iPhone dropped and there weren't enough chips, et cetera, et cetera. So same thing with automobiles, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that part is burning off as global supply uh, uh, chains are, are um, re-articulated. And the Fed has been working on the demand part. And it's, it's coming into focus enough for them to say they're done with this overnight this rate increase, the increase in the overnight interbank lending rate, the Fed funds rate, which was larger. These are, I've, I've aligned the last six or seven or, or five <laughs> Fed tightenings, read the headline. And um, they've, uh, at least not in recent years, moved uh, short-term rates as much as this. And so I think it's true that half the population of America has never lived at a time when the mortgage interest rate increased as much as it did in the last 18 months or two years. Think about that for a second. So this is a brand new experience for, you know, everybody up through whatever, Gen X. Um, the Fed's forecast was posted on Wednesday. I'm sorry I haven't updated. It's in the footnote if you want to look it up. It hasn't materially changed. This is their September forecast. And... Yesterday or on Wednesday, uh, Chairman uh, Powell um, made remarks that were right. There's three right there's three pieces of monetary policy um, using the overnight interest rate to anchor the short end of the Treasury yield curve, which is what you're seeing here, and um, quantitative tightening or quantitative easing, where the Fed uses its balance sheet. That's what you see here, and uh, as the balance sheet increases, liquidity is created and and now the Fed is uh, you know reabsorbing some of that excess liquidity, most of which was held on the liability side of their balance sheet in in commercial bank reserve deposits and in these reverse repos, reverse repurchase agreements, which are their new 
technique for injecting liquidity into the system. So they're draining out that liquidity, which was necessary after the pandemic to restore or secure confidence in the financial system, right? Confidence is liquidity. So interest rates, uh, quantitative easing or tightening, and then forward guidance. And the forward guidance from Chairman Powell uh, was quite explicit about anticipating the interest rate decreases that their committee members already are forecasting. This is their forecast. So in terms of your financing situation, I hope you're in floating rate debt because if you are, then it should reprice. And uh, and maybe a few years out, you want to think about refinancing whatever um, capital spending <clears throat> you know, you're going to in which you're going to engage, or if you're going to roll it into a mortgage later, you can expect a, a summon um, more accommodative interest rate environment to accompany that. Uh, the downside, a couple downsides here. Um, high interest rates, high domestic interest rates mean that the U.S. dollar is a really strong currency. These are Japanese visitor expenditure uh, numbers, daily expenditure numbers on the vertical axis or logs of uh, Japanese visitor spending, daily visitor spending. So between $200 and $300 a day, depending on the exchange rate, when the exchange rate varied between 80 and 120 yen in the first two decades of the century, today the exchange rate is 150 yen per dollar. And there's no Japanese visitors. You need to go to Tokyo Disney because it's so dirt cheap right now. But as interest rates normalize, uh, the um, Hawaii as a destination will become less expensive. Hawaii as a real estate market will become less expensive to Japanese and other uh, East Asian investors. And so I, I expect to see them uh, re-engage. Too late for Hawaiian Airlines, evidently, but... That, that's how that works. Um, the other thing to note in in um, financial markets is that the um, spread from mortgage rates to the risk free to a risk free benchmark. I've used the ten year Treasury note here. The spread from mortgage rates to the risk free benchmark is wider. That's the heavy blue line at the bottom. Is wider than it's been in again forty years. Nobody half of the population. Nobody up through Gen X has lived in a time when the spread from mortgage rates to the 10-year treasury note was 300 basis points. And I don't understand why that's true. That's why it says <laughs> WTF, because I have no idea why this is happening right now. Um, and after you would think after a year, somebody would have published a paper about this. Um, so, but that's a fact, Jack. So as the term structure subside, eases back in, you know, as the long-term treasury bond yields, you know, settle in both because of the apparent credibility of the Fed's commitment to returning inflation to its 2% goal and the, now the emerging apparent success of that uh, pre-commitment and the inflation risk premium that builds into the longer dated maturities as that burns off, um, the term structure of interest rates should subside. And who knows what the new equilibrium is. The Fed says that the overnight rate ought to end up at 2.5%. I'll take it. Uh, a 4% um, treasury note yield uh, wouldn't, uh, or 3% or wouldn't be too bad, right? It, this is where questions about the term structure are important because if you believe in the credibility of the Fed's pre-commitment, and I think everybody does. And dude, I learned this 20 years ago, so it's been a long time since I learned it. And it, it's you know, people, people, smarter people than me already knew it 20 years ago, when the Fed didn't even have um, a mon a uh, inflation goal, or technically when um, who was it? Come on, weren't you in this meeting where um, Ned Gramlich came to Bank of Hawaii? I heard Ned Gramlich was coming to Hawaii. He was a Fed governor. And it was one of the first times I ever sent a text message. I just figured this out. And um, anyway, he came to Bank of Hawaii and had this meeting with six of us. Six of us. Maybe, maybe Kamani was there. I can't remember. But it was like, um, 
anyway, it, it's, it was amazing. And who was the C Chief Investment Officer? Um, Bill Barton. And Bill Barton was this Michigan guy who was a monetary monetarist from the old days and always asked everybody, you know, are you a monetarist or a Keynesian? And it's like, dude, that's not been a thing for 30 years. And he asked Ned Gramlich if they had an inflation goal, which technically they did not, to be fair to Bill, because Ben Bernanke did not um, establish a public, you know, publicly a monetary policy inflation goal until January 2012. So that's the backstory. And then Gramlich's reply to Bill Barton was, in this is in 2005 now, you'd have to be living in a cave not to know that we have an inflation goal. <laughs> I was like, oh, snap, schooled by Ned Gramlich. And then, um, what's her name? Janet Yellen. She's Treasury Secretary now. When she was president of the San Francisco Fed, she came by Bank of Hawaii. We had all these amazing experiences at the bank. So the president of the San Francisco Fed comes to Bank of Hawaii, and she's in the executive dining room. And she's talking about this. And this is 2008 or seven or eight before the financial crisis is really intensified. And she's openly talking about a non-target target. She keeps talking about, well, our non-target target for inflation, the non-target target. Okay, so it's been 20 or 30 years since 2% was either the unknown or now known inflation target. And it seems pretty credible. And if you know that's going to be true, then why should you be rewarded for inflation risk for parting with your money for 10 or 20 or 30 years when the Fed's commitment is credible? That's the argument. I learned this from a city guy. So that the yield curve in the long term should be really flat. Okay, you with me? So if the yield curve is curve Let's say the overnight rate is two and a half percent. The yield curve is flat at three percent, and the historic spread to the mortgage rate is 175 basis points. Then the equilibrium 30-year fixed rate mortgage rate ought to be five percent. Let's call it 4.75. You with me? That the overnight money is two and a half percent. Risk-free money is three percent. Triple A corporate money ought to be what four percent, and the 30-year mortgage rate. Which is, you know, mortgages aren't that safe, but we pool all the risk in them, right? We have all this structure pooling and carving up the risk and distributing it, and then, and then, uh, you know, CDOs and then, and then CDSs on the CDOs and all this stuff. So two and a half, three percent risk free rate, four percent corporate rate, five percent mortgage rate. That's kind of the world. We're talking about a couple of years from now. Okay, I mean, Kamani was sort of asking. And I mean, plus or minus a half percentage point. Not 7% mortgage rate, which six months ago or three, four months ago was 8% mortgage rate. Okay, let's switch to the Hawaii forecast. These are DBED's new numbers. Pretty much same as the old numbers. And um, so 2% real growth. Yeah, plus 2%. Inflation, or two and a half, should be four and a half percent nominal growth, let's say. Um, so there you go. These are DBED's numbers, not mine. I don't have any. I mean, I could make some if you want to buy some. Um, and this is what it looks like. And the thing I will... Am I coming through okay? I'm getting a warning that my system resources are low. Um, I want to come back to this idea that we kind of, you see this sudden stop in 2019, something happened in Hawaii in the late 20 teens. We kind of, kind of petered out. Oh, maybe not Maui, but well, there's karma or whatever. But, um, <clears throat> so we'll come back to that. These are, these are forecasts for us GDP growth and inflation from the national association for business economics and their most recent survey uh, posted last week so you may recall we had a very strong third quarter number um but this path this u-shaped path right and these are the top five and the bottom five and the median <coughs> forecast is for the 
Fed's monetary policy tightening and the right. in, and the increase in mortgage rates and the slowdown in residential investment um, and the slowdown in job creation now to cause a deceleration in real economic activity, but not a recession. Right, it stays positive and then reaccelerates as we come out of the tail end of the year as inflation subsides. So that's that's the national forecast. And if you look at the same forecasters' uh, conjectures about the probability of recession uh, in the next year, about seventy-five of respondents, pers- blah, blah, about three quarters of respondents, say that the probability of recession is less than 0.5 and about a third say it's less than or a quarter say it's less than um, 0.25 so that's pretty good oh i'm sorry about a third say less than 0.5 and they're among the three quarters to say less than 0.5 as well um this is from a slightly older survey um, the, on balance, most economists view monetary policy as having gotten it about right, whereas um, there's probably too much stimulus from fiscal policy, and that was part of the demand s- surge, uh, the, the demand component in inflation numbers we looked at earlier. Uh, maybe, you know, maybe four trillion in pandemic stimulus would have sufficed instead of five, uh, but of course. Those are circumstances in which you can't afford to err on the wrong side. Um, anyway, um, in terms of risks to the outlook for next year, um, there's still some risk that monetary policy might have gotten it wrong. And then um, this, you know, geopolitical conflict situation are the two things that are weighing most heavily on uh, forecasters. Um, uh, this is supposed to be a shortfall. So let me walk into through some of the detail. I'll use mostly labor indicators um, to illustrate the difference between post-pandemic outcomes in Hawaii and nationwide. And this, you need to think about this when you're framing, say, the remainder of the decade of Hawaii, you know, economic expectations. So here's U.S. employment on the left, and then a trend estimate, a pre-pandemic trend estimate, from which I then calculate standard deviations on the right. You with me? So we were on trend, pandemic hits, sudden stop, recovery to within one standard deviation of the pre-pandemic trend. That's the national backdrop. Got it? So here's Hawaii. Hawaii got off the freeway before the pandemic. And this is the thing I was alluding to earlier. Governor Ige's second term. Now, it's complicated because the data were re-benchmarked in 2017, so there's a discontinuity. But, you know, you can see the shape, and you can see how far off the path. You know, we were two standard deviations away from uh, the path post-pandemic, and the gap was widening, not narrowing. That's, That's a Hawaii thing. We're doing that. That's all Hawaii. And here are the two back to back. And another kind of alignment to include jobs instead of, uh, in addition to persons. <clears throat> so something happened. We can think about that maybe a little later. Um, and then there's all these details. Since we're looking at labor market indicators, you have to be careful that it's not just the labor market. Um, so here's some details. Typically, after a recession, after an economic shock, productivity surges during the recovery, not during the recession, during the recovery, right? Because during the recovery, people don't hire at first. They try to get existing employees, right? They, you don't know if the recession's over when it's over, so you wait to hire and try to get everybody to work harder if business is actually improving until you feel certain enough that you can hire. So productivity tends to rise after the recession, not before. You can see that in 2009 and 10. 2020 though, the weird thing was, as soon as the pandemic hit and we all went home, productivity went up during the shock. 
that's a new thing. And you can see it in wages. But now you know, well, wait a minute, who lost their jobs during the pandemic? Disproportionately low wage workers, people in customer contact positions and so on, where all of us nerds who were working at a computer could keep on working at home and now we don't want to come back. And so you get this weird outcome where real wages in the higher quantiles of the wage distribution haven't, they went up initially and now they've kind of receded to where they were pre-pandemic, whereas real wages in the lowest quintile in this case have been really strong post-pandemic. And there's a couple different forces that are working on this and you'll have to get my slides and look at it if you want to understand it, because I still don't, but here's what I think is happening. Among the things that are happening, I, and, and let me just see some anecdotal evidence. So McDonald's in Kailua has a sign in the front. Their starting wage is $17 an hour to work at McDonald's. Now, I don't know what the minimum wage is, but $17, I know, yes, I'm an old futt, and I worked at Dole Cannery for $1.67 and a half cents an hour. And, okay, that was 50 years ago. $17, you know, isn't going to pay the rent, but this, that sounds like it's pretty good. You know what I mean? I'm just saying there's a thing happening at the low skill end of the pay spectrum. Initially, people didn't want to do those jobs because they could get COVID. They didn't want to, you know, be the cashier because then they have to breathe everybody's exhaust that walks by the cash register or they didn't want to work in food service or whatever. Whereas at the high end, what's happening is that people are looking for amenities like working from home and they're willing to take less remuneration, right? They're willing to take less cash pay if you let them have those hours at home that they used to spend commuting or you mitigate their daycare needs because they're, not having to leave their kids, you know, somewhere a couple of days a week for the hybrid worker. Now, these are great national data. We don't have the national data in as um, wonderful, um, you know, statistical uh, detail. But here's a sort of a, another anecdotal detail. Uh, look at the movement of food service compensation relative to professional and business services post pandemic. Again, on average, pre and post pandemic. They've moved up about the same amount, but it's, what's extraordinary is how much food service caught up after being basically, you know, after bombing during the, and how much less retail uh, pay has gone up um, than food service. Um, anyway, so the weird things happen. Uh, people quit in numbers that was unusually high, you know, more, you know, maybe two and a half to two to three percent of workers as opposed to the typical one and a half to two percent and um, really a, a real persistence in job openings that is subsiding now um, but so people were quitting and employers were having trouble hiring and um, whatever this says I'm, I'm bogging down here but it's cool because right opposite and um, and this which is where I was starting and do we really want to know maybe not but you got to check out all this cool stuff you guys oh this one is awesome i'm going to skip over this so there's this weird thing that's happened where at the low end um there's more of a shortage of workers than than there was before uh putting upward pressure there but at the high end of the skill and pay spectrum uh people are looking for amenities and um, and wages haven't gone up that much. And here's the, the takeaway. Health services is one of these unique places where discouraged workers exited the industry. You know, nurses and a lot of people who are just in the trenches. And, um, and that's on top of, you know, the demographic effects. Like I had the same doctor since 1985 and he just retired. And I'm totally... 
I have no idea where my I have my primary care physician now is a, a nice woman who is really old and she's working two and a half days a week. <laughs> so you have to get sick on the right day. No, I mean, it's that you guys are seeing the same thing, right? So there's all these post pandemic forces that are complicating the employment landscape on top of the fact that there are more people in the age 30 to 60 cohort in Hawaii than there are in the age in the under 30 cohort. That's, that's a fact check. So when you're highly experienced, highly skilled from learning on the job or from all the credentialing that they've acquired with human capital formation in the course of their working lifetime, when that person retires, there's only a fraction of a young person waiting in the wings to be hired. That's not changing. A hundred years ago, there were 30 persons under the age of 65 for each person over. Next year, next decade, there will be two. Two working persons, working age persons for each person over the age of 65. One of who, which working persons, working age persons, is not a college graduate. So where exactly are they going to fit into the skill spectrum of, of Queen's Health Systems or in your, you know, property development or management area? Um, a final sort of technical thing, and I'll, I'll stop for Q&A, and I pulled this up from an appendix, but I think it's important for you guys. Pre-pandemic, 90% of workers in America almost or never, almost never or never worked from home. Okay, pre-pandemic. We didn't even measure this in Hawaii pre-pandemic because it's so rare. And less than 5% of workers worked from home full-time pre-pandemic, less than 4%. Today, these are the Hawaii data. About a quarter of all workers in Hawaii work from home full-time or hybrid, about half-half, half full-time, half hybrid. And it's a remarkably stable pattern uh, now in the last year or so. <clears throat> so it's not, it's, this is it. This is the new normal. And we're not going back. I know there's a lot of companies that seem to think they're going to get people to work back and are obsessing over it. But um if you look at the composition of the workforce now, so at the bottom, full-time workplace, in the middle in the light section hybrid at the top, full-time work from home, yeah? You can see hybrid and full-time work from home are and are more common at higher incomes, at higher levels of educational attainment. They're more common among younger workers, than older workers, there are no substantial differences across genders, although slightly higher uh, hybrid adoption, slightly uh, by females, maybe not statistically significantly higher. Uh, more prevalence in larger households, not the largest, but larger than smaller households, and more prevalence in households with children in the household, which makes sense and uh, because of, you know, traditional um, patterns it may, is not inconsistent with slightly higher female uh, uh, adoption. So that's where we're at. Uh, and it's had bigger impacts. And so let me draw some of the real estate implications out. Google was publishing these data. They stopped a year ago, unfortunately. But they that what they showed was this is from your smartphone. Um, how much time is spent at home? How much time is spent in workplaces? <clears throat> you can see see the initial impact of the of the uh, pandemic, but then things did not go back to normal. <coughs> so sorry. So people spent about thirty percent time less time in workplaces, about twenty percent less time in retail and food services establishments or at the gym because it's on the way home from work, or they are on the way home from work, and about 5% more time at home. Why is the time at home higher? Because people are using the extra time they save from not commuting, which is about an hour a day. Um, you know, about one third on their family, about one third in leisure, and about one third in additional work, by the way. So if you think of the extra hour people are getting, on average, 
it's about 20 minutes for the family, 20 minutes in leisure, and 20 minutes in additional work. Um, blah, 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 e-commerce, blah, 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 right? This is, right, the, the pandemic accelerated the adoption of e-commerce, but post-pandemic, it looks like it's gone back to trend, but the trend is not favorable for strip malls. I'm just saying, right? If you if you own a you know a strip mall somewhere that's not the greatest performer, you might want to be thinking about last mile fulfillment or self storage or something like that. Um, and then this extraordinary change in the number of applications for a federal employer employer ID number, which I thought I thought was going to jump after the pandemic and then subside to the pre-pandemic trend. No, it's totally taken a new, I don't know who the, these are, TikTok influencers or somebody, but something happened there too. In the housing market, and this goes to Kamani's question, I'm going to run out of time to get really in, into the detail here, and I think I'll cut myself off. But you can see the work from home event has had an impact on home prices. I don't think it changes the long-term trend. So I was showing this to Kauai Realtors on Wednesday. So that's why they're highlighted. Um, um, I don't, this is not a bubble like the Japan bubble or the subprime bubble, but it is a thing. It did happen. Uh, I, I I can't decide if we've reverted to trend or not. This just shows you the rest of California. So Hawaii and the rest of California, you get the drift. And if you adjust for inflation, the long-term path here, right? These are logs. So if you, you imagine a line that goes through this, it has a slope of about 2% after inflation and about 4.5% before inflation adjustment. And the question I raised a second ago is, did this work from home surge, which is over, did that, and where did that come from? If you're working from home, you don't need to live in proximity. You don't need to have a shorter commute. So we saw, especially on Oahu, housing demand pushed outward to suburbs and then more generally to exurbs and even more broadly to Zoom towns, they're called, places that aren't even in the same state. Kauai and Maui seem to be one of these Zoom towns, broadly speaking. And uh, so there are people that moved to Kauai and to Maui, um, not so much West Hawaii from the data I've seen. Um, am I getting that backwards? Yes, I'm getting that backwards. I mean, it's hard to tell because we don't see the composition of the, we don't see the buyer composition, but I'm inferring this from the price move that something specific happened, which did not happen to condos on Oahu. Why? Because condos on Oahu are spatially distributed in proximity to the downtown employment centers, Waikiki, Kapilani, Koreamoku, whatever, and uh, downtown. Whereas the housing demand pushed outward to East Honolulu, Windward Oahu, North Shore, Makakilo and Mililani, the first year after the pandemic, and then subsided and then went back. So between the vagabond workers and the uh, hybrid workers, there's a one-time push in valuations. Now that uh, I'm just showing this for Kauai because it was easy to grab, but I have the same thing for Oahu and Maui and for Kona side at least. The mortgage rate here is inverted. Once that mortgage rate goes back to, say, a number like 6 or 5%, we'll see those home sales uh, rebound. And I think this is pretty much the end. I just want <clears throat> to conclude with them. Um, you guys should check this out. It's kind of interesting. Where I started with Hawaii going off the rails, this is kind of a serious thing, you guys. I don't know. Nobody's really talking about it. Uh, so this is GDP. Uh, I've, I've aligned U.S. and Hawaii just to give you a feel for how different the Hawaii experience has been since the late 20 teens. We detached from our own trend and it was a shared trend with the nation uh, all through the 20 teens. And I, you know, that's a big gap. Even if we restore potential GDP growth at so let's say call it 1.8%, the gap persists. And in per capita terms, you know, it, it's not good you guys. <laughs> So we used to have higher per capita GDP than the rest of the country. And we used to have higher per capita income than the rest of the country. So to me, these are issues 
and I'll just stop there. I, I I've run out of the hour, but I know we left some time for discussion for those of you who can stay, and I will send you, um, the you know I'll send you the the slides so you can, right? Check this out. Who does this? Hawaii does this. People are leaving. It's not like a one-year thing. Okay, all right, enough whining, blah, blah, blah. I don't know what all this other stuff is. Yeah, pow. So, <clears throat> questions? And there was a question in the chat. Oh, yeah, two of them. Can I comment on the movement of the workforce? Yeah, I'm in Colorado. I come here as often as I can, which is mostly in the winter because my wife is a Maui girl. And she, so I have to stay home in the summer. Um, my, my boys live here. But the weird thing is when I get on the plane, every time bro, I see people from Hawaii who live here now. Every time. And they all seem to be in first class. What's up with that? They're all real estate guys. Get Chuck Wathen and these other real estate guys. Um. There's a thing happening, and part of it's generational, right? People cash in their house, and they, uh, you know, their house is their nest egg, and they cash in, and they move to Oregon. But um, the I showed you the migration data briefly. I'll go back to that because it is, if this will allow me to, it is kind of interesting. We don't have a, a, a recent estimate of this. Um, but this is the composition, this is the um, composition of educational attainment by migrant, migratory status from the mid-20-teens. So what I'd be curious to see is, you know, the next calibration of the post-pandemic, I want to see the 2023 to 2025, 2027 data. What's striking about this is that Domestic in migrants, people moving to Hawaii, have the highest educational attainment profile. And people moving away from Hawaii, whether residents, right, whether they're domestic out migrant, mi migrants, or for that matter, the international in migrants, which I think is a, I don't know if that's, that, I, I don't know as much about that number. It's not a huge number. That's my Filipino cousins, right? They they all have higher educational attainment profiles than residents on average. What's that telling you? What that's telling you is that human capital is your ticket to mobility. You're free to move around the country, right? And with working from home, now you can work from anywhere. And this is especially true after the pandemic, because we all realize even if we don't know Zoom like me. We can fake it. I totally faked this thing. I don't know if it's recording. Somehow you guys told me I'll come back in because nobody left and I was able to come back in. I have no, there's a total divine mystery to me why this presentation is actually working. But here we are. So right now there's something happening in Hawaii. I'm not really sure what it is. It's, it's happening. These data haven't been revised yet. The statewide data have been revised. The intercensal estimates. <clears throat> but we know on every island, population growth bogged at the end of the 20 teens, and it bogged pre pandemic. And that can't be a good thing. And my list, so my list is well, it starts with Super Fairy, but okay, let's not go there. You can't build telescopes in Hawaii, we dismantle telescopes in Hawaii. We don't build telescopes in Hawaii. Well, here's another one. I think I have these on a list. This is my this is my wine list. Have a little cheese with your wine. Uh, is this the one? No, this is. I have a good one somewhere. But check this out. I don't know. Do you guys know? Do you, you know the story of my dad? He's a plant breeder. My grandfather was a plant breeder. This is his house. My grand, my dad was a plant breeder. 
in the course of my dad's career, from the time he started graduate school in 1948 to the time he retired from UH in, 19, in 2018, they just he just wouldn't retire. They, they had to kick him out. They had to kick him out of UH. Corn yields increased sevenfold. My dad was a corn guy. In the 60s, he comes out. We come out to Hawaii in 61. He realizes, shoots, you can grow corn year-round in Hawaii. Well, you should. Corn is from Central America. It's from the tropics. Duh. But Iowa's not the tropics. So everybody forgot that the Mesoamericans grew two crops of corn. And so he brought the seed industry to Hawaii. My dad, my grandfather, all these dudes. And then came the anti-GMO movement, just like the anti-vax guys. That's the disinformation stuff I was talking about earlier. That famous geneticist, Walter Ritty, right? And a $240 million industry, agricultural industry, one quarter, 10 years ago, seed corn in Hawaii was one quarter of all agriculture $240 million industry. All agriculture today is only a $350 million industry. And was it the corn? No, hell no. The seed is an SD card. The industry was about coding the maize genome. You with me? Agriculture in Hawaii is not about food. We get food at the supermarket. It doesn't come from Hawaii. All the commercials you see about, oh, let's go volunteer and go down to the Lo'i on Saturday and get, you know, go muck around in the water and get leptospirosis or whatever. Yeah, no, 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 no. Bogus. Agriculture in Hawaii is going to be about science. It'll be if you can grow the next cure for cancer or whatever, right? It's going to be about biotech. But we chase those guys out. Who won the Nobel Prize for inventing CRISPR-Cas9 technology three years ago? A graduate of Hilo High School, Professor Dudna from Berkeley, from Cal, won the Nobel Prize for inventing the technology that we outlawed in three out of four counties in Hawaii. It's insane. So we dismantle telescopes. We don't do transgenic modification. Right, and now we can't build houses after a wildfire. I mean, you tell me what's going on, but there's something really, right? The verbatim now, the objective of the Hawaii Tourism Authority Destination Management Action Plan verbatim is to, and I quote, decrease the number of visitors to Oahu. Woohoo! That's their objective. So you tell me what's going on. Because I have no idea. Check this out. 50 years ago, how many housing units are authorized by building permit? I'm going to go look for the data because you're not going to believe me. Are authorized by building permit on the island of Maui every year? Answer, about 300. 50 years ago, it was 3,000, okay. like okay. in a year. So we're that's that's like my story about SpaceX, right? Nobody, everybody forgot how to build rockets. Everybody who knew how to build rockets retired because no rocket had been in, built in America since the Saturn V in 1980. And there's my brother in the early 2000s going over to SpaceX and... Uh, Anyway, okay. Uh, I what is the living wage? I don't know. As Green creates a financial strategy. Okay, wait. Let's go to the first construction costs. Um, I I do have those data, and if you send me an email, get Leah to uh, get you my email address. I'll send it to you. So, uh, an easy way to illustrate this is with the producer price index for construction. And um, so it looks, it's like basically a diagonal line. In the 1970s, it broke upwards. Remember the, 
OPEC crises and whatnot. So there's a huge increase one time, step up, and then it went back to a trend. And the trend was 2.4% per year. 2.4% per year construction cost inflation. Then come the supply chain disruptions post-pandemic. Another break. 40% increase in construction costs in one year. And now it's back on trend. So I think now the costs are higher, right? They, they went up. Not a lot of them went back down. With, with eggs, right, you had a supply chain disruption and avian flu. So we had to cull all the layer, the, ch the chickens, and then raise a new cohort of egg laying chickens. And now they're busy at work laying eggs. So that's, but with some of these building materials, you know, I hear these stories like, where were people getting their granite countertops pre-pandemic or pre-Trump? China. But then Trump put a 20% tariff on everything from China. So people start looking around. Maybe we'll use quartz, right? Uh, maybe we'll find, maybe it's worth starting up a new marble quarry in Georgia. So now one of the largest sources is Georgia. But then the supply chain disruption came and messed all of that up. Meanwhile, the builders have moved away from granite. The consumer, you know, we're talking about new condos in Kakako, right? The consumer has grown comfortable with, oh, yeah, these quartz products, right? Quartz and epoxy, and you mash it together and heat. So these are just stories I hear from construction people. But if you give people a reason to make an adjustment, some of them will adjust to a, an alternative, a cheaper alternative. And in addition, the disruption, it's the source of the disruption, whether it was the OPEC crisis, the cartel in the 1970s, or the post-pandemic supply chain disruption more recently, those are pretty rare events. And I, for planning purposes, I would just count on 2.5% construction cost inflation. You're not going to be off by that much. And you can go download DBEDS to Hawaii construction cost indices and kind of get a, a feel, you know, to what extent our experience uh, deviates from that. But sorry about dismissing the question of the living wage. I just, um, I tend to think of it, right? So a living wage, the living wage thing, you have to remember the people that do this are advocates, right? So somewhere along the line, uh, you, Aloha United Way. Aloha United Way, right? They used to collect money from everybody and distribute money. And now they are doing, evidently, they're doing all this research. So they're the Alice people. The Alice people, A-L-I-C-E. I don't know what it stands for. And those are people basically below the median income. Well, when income in Hawaii was 30% higher than the national average, and well, so what's the distribution of income, right, around that point, right? So... Some of the people below the median income had incomes higher than the national average. If ours was 30% above, and it was like that for 40 years, we were rocking and rolling in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, even the 80s. And then that collapsed. And now our income per capita now is 10% lower than the national average. So not only are all the people below the median income sucking gas, even some of the people above median income are sucking gas. So that's the way I think of it. So whatever you think the li so living wage says, I add up all the things I need to live, and that's how much money I'm get I need to get paid. Right? Alternate methodology. Okay. Whatever it was before, whatever it is now, it can't possibly satisfy what it did before. When income was 30% higher than average versus 10% lower than average. And second, God does not wake up every day and say, you deserve to be paid a living wage. I hate to say it. That's why I was doing all of that labor market stuff before. There's some weird stuff going on in the labor market right now. And low wage, low skill workers are getting paid way more than they were. Nobody's talking about the minimum wage. Because it's not relevant. For now, 
it'll be a problem at some other point in time and then it'll be on the front page of the newspaper but it's not a thing now because this weird post pandemic thing happened in the labor market whereas if you look at the data high skilled professionals many of whom a quarter a third half of all of whom are able to work remotely without any loss of productivity right those workers aren't actually getting paid as much more as they used to be relative to lower quantiles of the income distribution because they're getting paid in kind with amenities like not having to commute every day. So, so all of the above, right? It's, it's pay attention to all of it. Um, so as Queens creates a financial strategy what national strategies, oh man, I don't know. I, I have to tell you, I worked for a year with a large um, asset manager. First time, Kamani would love this. We, we should have been on this team together, Kamani. I don't know what you do over there at Queens, but it was like everything we should have been doing at Bank of Hawaii, but weren't on the investment strategy committee because I got to do unreal math. And, um, and by the way, there, so I'll tell you sort of loosely what the result was. You know, if you look at the risk return frontier, you know, commercial real estate was still kind of in there. Uh, lodging, which had really performed well, I thought looked better than it should. I think lodging in Hawaii is under a lot of pressure right now. Because, dude, the anti-tourism denialists are coming after you. Period. Right. Listen to what's happening on Maui right now. Oh, we have to have shared sacrifice. Oh, what you mean shared sacrifice? All you buggers, all you aunties that own a vacation rental, got You got to live. You got to let people live inside there. Long term rental. And there's like there's some evil offshore environment. No, but it's everybody's auntie owns a vacation rental. You understand what I'm saying? We're not going to build two thousand houses on Maui, we're going to steal 2000 vacation rentals and compel their owners to make them available to Lahaina refugees at long-term rental rates, which are lower than short-term rental rates. I'm just saying that's a weird world. And, um, but I did allude to some of the problems in commercial real estate. Do you need as much office space when people come in a couple of days a week, four days a week? How does that work? Or do you need a different kind of office space? Um, and that thing with retail, bruh, this is, so I come out here to Colorado. I'm out in the country. Usually I rent a car. I drive it home. I go shopping. I stock up, you know, like a, like a, like a fur trapper. I stock up for the winter. I return the car to Denver International Airport. I catch the bus to Boulder. I get an Uber out to my house. And I live here for a month without going anywhere. And when I need something, Amazon.com delivers it. Or I get some dude to, from Tarjay to drive it out to my house for 10 bucks. Is it worth 10 bucks to have some dude drive some stuff out to my house from Tarjay in Boulder? Hell yeah. Compared to $70 a day to rent a car. I mean, we live in a different world now. I don't have to go out to eat. So re retail, commercial, you got to think about that. You got to make sure you're in the right position. And as I, I mentioned, last mile delivery, last mile fulfillment, that's an interesting, there's an interesting model unfolding in, uh, you know, the merchandise part of the, um, of the consume, of the consumption spectrum. In the services part, like where healthcare comes in, we're sorting it out, right? Like this appointment, I'm going to go see my cardiologist. Next appointment, I'm going to Zoom. So I don't have to be in Hawaii, right? I got my blood pressure. I do all my stuff over here. My oxygen sticky finger thing inside, right? And I tell them what it's looked like. I send them an email with my last four months of randomly sampled blood pressure data. You know, so, I mean, if something happens, sure, I can get on a plane or I can go see a doctor here, but 
um, that's that's a different world. And by the way, the workers coming to Hawaii, the vagabond workers moving to Hawaii that are part of that bid upward in home prices, they got some money, bro. They need health care. So these things are all happening on small margins, but I don't ignore them because they are probably part of a larger structural shift that happened, just like the construction costs, right? It you know, it was going 2.4%, it goes doink, and then from here on out, it's going to go 2.4%. That is kind of a guess, but an educated guess. But that, that's the way I would think from a planning standpoint. And yes, by the way, people have to leave. Don't hesitate. Anything else? You want to wait to see if I can find some of that other uh, housing stuff? Because it's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, any other uh, audible questions? Want somebody want to shoot me an audible while I'm looking at this? Um, Paul, this is Nalina Andrade. Uh, yeah. Sorry, my video isn't working this morning. But the question oh, I oh, had, yeah. okay, the question I had is, when we, you know, the rail was supposed to be when it was first planned to be a stimulus for development along that uh, that that uh, that uh, laid out alignment, yeah. um, of course, which has changed many times. It was also seen as a way to connect um, both commerce and. <laughs> At, at the highest levels. Where do you see the rail going, um, you know, just projecting out for the next five years and its impact to, to our economy and you know, to I've education? Worked, I've worked with a lot of, I, do you see data on your screen now? Yeah. Those of you who have a screen. So I've worked with a lot of developers in the Takako area and the Kapilani, I call it Korea Moku Street. And, um, I don't think the train is going to get there. I mean, just personally, I don't think the train is going to reach Ala Moana, and I don't think the stadium is going to be redeveloped. So let's say I'm right. That means that the <clears throat> spatial equilibrium, right there, there, there was an equilibrium pre-pandemic where everybody had to get in their car, get in the zipper lane, and come downtown because we all hung out downtown and there was a walmart and a longs right and yeah 25 fa restaurants which in the treasury of bank of hawaii by the way we kept a, a, a rating system on a spreadsheet on the bloomberg terminal of 25 fa restaurants um for you know for going to lunch okay that's changed and you have to think about repositioning buildings and whatnot um, the train coming into downtown is based on that model. Whereas if we're not going to do that, or, you know, not as many people are going to do that, say two thirds as many, um, that means that the traffic won't be as bad and to begin with, but it was never about the traffic. The train was always about housing. It was about where you build housing. You build it in proximity to the infrastructure that gives you mobility. The change now is that that housing won't be in the, you know, there's not as compelling a reason to have it in the urban core or in proximity, by which I mean time now, say a 15 minute ride or a 30 minute ride. Um, in my mind, where I see the train, you know, the train goes from nowhere. I mean, there's nothing at the terminus, not even a parking lot, to a long stadium. It'll eventually get to the airport, which is totally cool for people in central and west Oahu. And then it'll come down Dillingham, maybe. And it, it, it could get downtown. But as I say, the foundation for getting downtown has shifted. So... From a commercial real estate development standpoint and a residential development standpoint, and I hate to say this because I was all about triumph of the city, which is an expression Ed Glazer, the Harvard housing economist, uses as the title of his book, right? The positive 
agglomeration of externalities that are the unintended compensation for our proximity, right? We all went to the same place. We all went to the campus or went to the downtown or went to the resort because of the, partly because of the happenstance combinatoric interactions that allowed us to be more productive in proximity, in each other's presence. You know, where Kamani was in another building, but an elevator ride and a walk across a breezeway could mean we could have meetings with one another. Well, we could do that on Zoom. So that ironically shifts to me the center of urban gravity towards central and west Oahu. And it's, iron, it's ironic because it was supposed to shift it to the node that the traditional downtown slash harbor complex provided, right? Most cities are built at harbors. There's harbors. There's no reason for Las Vegas to exist. So they had to invent gaming and prostitution in order for Las Vegas to exist. And we're not talking about that now. So as I, you know, I should probably not talk about it either. You need to get Brubaker out of the room and stop talking about it and get these kids in the room who've never lived in a time when everybody sucked it up and went downtown to work. The, bro, the glory days, bro, in the 80s and the 90s, it was awesome to be downtown. And anyway, we, that's, we don't live in that world. And as I say, it's ironic, but it looks to me like the scent that like, think of the, think of the rail system as an attractor, right? A strange attractor and things are gravitating towards stations as nodes, but they're dispersed. Yeah. They're not like grand central station where everybody's trying to get to. Anyway, that's, that's the way I think of it. But what do I know? The data we're looking at here are typical for the four counties. These are the Maui data I alluded to. And you can see the volume here in the 50 years ago, in the 70s. These are logs. Is about 10 times, right? 120 units per quarter versus 1,200 units per quarter. At the peak, I'll concede it was at the peak. Now, we live in a different world. There's a reason demographics, for one thing, are a good reason for this trend to come down. Um, we don't know really how this cycle. So I, in the rest of the graph here, I've decomposed the raw data into three components. So the, the three black components add up to the blue component. So you can <laughs> extract the trend in the cycle. And... I don't know if there's going to be, looking at this, I don't know if there's going to be another cycle in the 2020s. The way I look at this, we just had the last cycle, the new urbanism cycle. And I so I wouldn't be surprised if we spent a lot of time sort of hemming and hawing, like we're doing now, having community meetings, right? What's the first thing they said we have to do after the wildfire? We need to have community meetings. I'm like, no, bro, you need to build some houses now. That it's the exact opposite. And so I hear, I get an email from my friends at Lurf. You know the guy David Arcala, Land Use Research Foundation. Oh, newsflash! Governor is going to have a press conference at 10 a.m. about Aloha Stadium. <laughs> I text him back, right, never going to happen. Which which Aloha Stadium redevelopment plan was this? I thought we already had one of those. I mean, no? Isn't it obvious that we should be building multifamily housing at the Aloha Stadium train station? It's obvious to me. Isn't it obvious that you should have a park and ride with condos on top at every train station from not the Coppola train station, which they call the Coppola train station for some reason, all the way to, I mean, right? You and I already know that. You should have built the condos. Dude, the train station is a condo. Yes. But we didn't do that. So I, I, I'm concerned we'll have a period of extended 
what are we going to do until these kids, right? And you saw the chart. There's much higher. I was totally shocked at this. Working from home, right? Work from home participation. Higher incomes, totally makes sense. Higher educational attainment, totally makes sense. Fe female and male participation, about the same. It's not as surprising as I thought. We've, we sort of overcome some of the old gender, not all of them, um, but this thing where younger people are more likely to work from home than boomers. Because I am a boomer and I am exact opposite. I am like liberated. I can work from home. Why aren't all of my friends doing this? But I hear these guys talk about we want our we want our kids to come back to the office where they can be mentored and no about it. You just want to see them. You mistake observational surveillance for productivity measurements. You're looking at the input, not the output. Right? My wife, mm -hmm. I won't tell you where she works, they they track her mouse movement. I keep telling her. You need to buy one of those machines that moves your mouse around when you leave your desk. <laughs> it got those, you know what I mean? Because if you're talking to her while she's sitting at her desk, she's always reaching over. And, e -e. E -e. It's hilarious. Um, what was I saying? So commercial real estate, maybe think about, I don't, I don't know, maybe try to get some young kids if you can find any. Right, who have a completely different concept of where I'm not talking about, you know, all the other stuff. I mean, it drives me crazy. Oh, no, dude, nobody gives a crap about your self esteem. You know what I mean? But oh, this is what they've all been taught in elementary school. You know why? Because my kids were in elementary school when that was like the most important. Don't tell your son that he misspelled the word, it's not wrong. I'm like, it's totally wrong, and nobody's going to understand what he writes. <laughs> That was, I can never forget my first grade teacher, his first grade teacher telling me, no, you can't tell him it's wrong. I'm like, but it's literally wrong. So that's that generation, right? The 30 somethings. They got some ideas. They're finally, you know, the 20s are kind of worthless, but it starts to get real, right? When you, you know, you kind of, your late 20s and your early 30s, it starts to get real and they start thinking about the same things you are. Um, so maybe that's that's where to get the fresh ideas. I had one more question, uh, Paul, and and, yeah. and this is because uh, you know I I I uh, oversee the Native Hawaiian Health and the Diversity ah. Equity and Inclusion uh, and Social Justice, where we really look at um, health equities in in very um, depressed communities and in yeah. special populations, and um, you know. Two questions. One is for Molokai, um, and the other is for pockets of Native Hawaiian communities, like out on West Oahu, where economic development is so essential, and tourism doesn't work. Uh, uh, at least on Molokai, it works only partially on West Oahu, and so one of the things we're looking at, because there have been a few very successful models on the continent about using population health strategies and bringing together um, coalitions and aligning um, organizations, state government funding, taxation, all of this, all the, these different pieces to come together to create um, a health-based, education-based economy, which to me makes eminent sense for Molokai. Um, and it would, I think, make sense for pockets of Nanakuli um, y and I, and possibly Maka, something that, if you recall, several years ago, the Napua project for Kamehameha schools they attempted to do. Um, but this this entails a lot of coordination, right, with a lot of different organizations. And what scares me going, not going on in Maui is for all those community meetings. You don't see a cohesion um, and focus in terms of how do we how do we restore this community, but better? A lot of rhetoric, but no real action in planning. What, when you look at the economic forecasts, what do you see? Is it realistic for Queens?
to go into a smaller community, which is a microcosm of the Native Hawaiian community throughout the state, uh, and make a difference uh, as an economic stimulus using healthcare. And then on West Oahu. Granted, there are very different dynamics, but I know you have a background in economics to um, have some ideas about that. So I, I feel like I have to separate three, yeah. three separate things. The first is the meeting thing to which you alluded. Let's have a meeting. And I've been sitting in those. So I'm a consultant to a subcontractor to a, I call them the carpet baggers. These guys from DC, my, my crew is from uh, uh, New Orleans, right? They're all Hurricane Katrina. After Hurricane Katrina, they started up their gig and now they chase hurricanes and natural disasters around. So they have some real expertise. And then they they work for federal agencies. And I don't see a lot getting done in that sort of meeting thing. And I'm really puzzled by it. Um, now I'm not sitting there, so it's weird. I'm sitting in their meetings and then they're sitting in meetings with Maui County and community people and whatnot, not me, them. And um, it looks to me, I, I still think of myself as an outsider, and it looks to me like absence of leadership. But leadership, so it, ha, it involves all of these governance questions. I'm working on the same thing, by the way, with, with tourism, right? Because over tourism requires destination management, which we realize now requires a new tourism governance structure. And we don't know what it is, but it's not what we got. So we're hung up on a bunch of these things in different areas. But it used to be, you know, the governor said do this and appointed somebody and then, right, it used to be top down. I'm not, I'm not understanding how all of this bottom up. And then the proliferation of nonprofits, OMG, who can keep them straight? So there's this weird organizational slash leadership slash thing happening I don't understand at all. Then there's the question of, am I'm, I'm, I understanding you correctly, which is health services delivery as economic activity per se. So as a kind of a node for human capital, employment, services delivery. Yes, and social social entrepreneurship. Okay, so... And so now uh, Molokai and West, uh, West Oahu. And so that sounds interesting to me. Um, the challenge in health services delivery or say social entrepreneurship is scale. It's hard to scale yes. and, and you need scale to lower your average cost. You transcend that. I had that one slide with, the map, the Google map, Google Earth yeah. map of Hawaii, and then the outline of Iowa, the, the same thing. It's because we have, right, we fly Boeing 737s and Boeing 717s around, around Inner Island. And in Iowa, they don't fly those planes. They drive or they have Embraer's or something. And the message, the point there is that we have to transcend our geographic remoteness. So the only way I can conceive of scaling what we're talking about is by delivering services or the fruits of entrepreneurship outside the geographic confines of Molokai or say West Hawaii, West Hawaii, right? The, the market has to be bigger than Molokai or has to be bigger than Nanakuli. And then finally, which, right, technology, we can do that now. We, there we are. Yeah. We can do that. So then finally, um, there's, a, there's an invert, there's an, you can think of what we're talking about from an inverted standpoint. So we have the organizational, I don't know what's happening. Then we have, if we can scale up, you know, we have this architecture, which if we can scale it, really becomes robust and then we have turn everything on its head and and somehow forget about health or 
social entrepreneurship just for a second, just have some economic activity that by creating income and wealth enables people to acquire whatever that's missing, whatever they're missing in terms of health outcomes. And that's where I think we've been going in the opposite direction. So Molokai is the perfect example because 50 years ago, right, the seed industry I ta- alluded to earlier, the first meeting of the Hawaii Crop Improvement Association was, Association was at Hotel Molokai in the winter of 1969. There were 200 seed companies there, right? After Del Monte left, all this land on Molokai became available. And so that's where the actual genetics, you know, uh, where the industry first started was Molokai. And of course, in those days, you had the Sheraton way out in uh, at the western end of Molokai. And then Molokai Ranch was doing some stuff. Over the course of the decades, each one of those has been shot down. Every single one. There's a, I think there's a residual seed operation going on in down Kanakakai area. And, and those guys are some of the original guys. Auntie Bet, the, uh, she's married to, I can't remember his name. Dude, she was my dad's graduate student in 1967 when they first went over there and she never left. Wow. Canadian, little Canadian girl. And then she adopted seven kids. So everybody, everybody knows her as Auntie Bet. Nobody knows she has a PhD in genetics. But, um, you know, I think we're, this is the, the reason I bring this third leg of the stool up is that we seem to be actively shooting these things down right now. Science-based industry in particular. Mm-hmm. And that ties back to the dis and misinformation challenges we face. The thing with vaccination is crazy. I just found my brother's vaccination card and some old papers from my dad. And I looked at every single one was 1962, 1962, 1962, 1962. And I'm a 1955 baby, right? And so I gave it to my brother. And he was like, how come I never got vaccinated until 1962? And I said, because the vaccines didn't exist before 1962. I had measles. I had mumps. I had whooping cough. I had everything except polio. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because we had a polio vaccine in 1955. But in those days, you got sick. That's how you got immunity. And now, and so for a whole half century, we were all like, thank God for vaccines. And now everything is, oh, hell no. I'm not getting vaccinated. (laughs) What are we going to do when a quarter of the population, a quarter of the kids in schools is unvaccinated? Because that's next year. (laughs) I mean, that's coming Um, at light speed at us very quickly. Um, We, I don't know what to do about the third leg of the stool, but as an economist, I'm thinking if you shoot down industry after industry, you want to talk about science-based industry and you're actively shooting down astronomy and transgenic modification, that, like, that's the leading edge. Um, so I think you're left in the middle where you're all, you're intuitively already positioned with health services delivery per se as a known industry, kind of quantum. And then social entrepreneurship, that has a lot of unknown attributes to it um, and involves a certain a different kind of human capital you know risk-taking behavior the ability to absorb losses right 999 out of a thousand times you're gonna lose um, that's that's what that kind of entrepreneurship involves um, but we're in this this position suddenly it was actually there but we only realized it recently where we can scale we're, we can scale globally mm-hmm. because of the technology. And yeah. people are just starting to, well, you know who's doing it. It's all these kids on TikTok and Instagram, and they're just wasting their time, as far as I can tell. But it tells you that there's something there. There's a there there because of the scalability of the internet. 
So surely there's something that maybe doesn't quite get us to a cure for cancer. You know what I mean? That's scalable, yeah. that we can export, whether it's ideas or culture or life. I mean, I don't, I don't even know what I'm talking about. I just know people are making money. People are making money in a way I, having seen it as an economist, I still cannot conceive of what is happening. And they're making more money than me. And I'm busting my butt doing this stuff, right? Doing analytics. Who cares? That's great. Thank you. Thank Good luck you. with it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Paul, well, Paul, but you're getting those in kind amenities. Paul, well, appreciate it as always. Yeah. Thanks, Eric. Um, I will send you the file. Yeah. And then um, please, um, let's follow up uh, on a couple things. Thanks, you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. Well. Happy holidays. Nice to see you. Oh, if there you. is a recording, I will send it. I'll send a link. <laughs> Thank right. you so Aloha. much. Aloha. Aloha. Thanks, Eric. Aloha, everyone. Thank you.